Welcome back to one of my favorite gun places. It is the Holt Sealed Bid Sale. They have over 5,000 lots here, well over 3,000 guns. We're gonna have a little look around today, see what we can see, see what we can find, see what we like, see what we don't. And I'm on a bit of a mission. I've got a shopping list. I can't tell you what's on it. Let's go. First thing I do when the sealed bid online catalog comes up is go straight into the search function, usually actually leave it a couple of weeks so they get some lots uploaded, and search in Purdy, Holland and Holland and Boss. Because I am dreaming one day that these guys will make a mistake, which they won't, and put something really delicious in. In this particular sale, there is this. This is an 1874 Purdy hammer gun, a top lever hammer gun. This is lot 7110 with a value of seven to 900 pounds. There's a lot to love about this gun and also a lot potentially to load. No, I loathe the wrong word. There's a lot of holes you can pick in it. As we said, it's an 1874 Purdy hammer gun. Sunken rib of saying J Purdy 314 and a half Oxford Street, London. Sounds like something out of Harry Potter. The hammers are rebounding, meaning that when you fire the hammer, it goes forward, strikes, and then rebounds. It means you don't have to pull it to half cock to open it, which is quite nice. The island locks are something I absolutely love. And by island lock, I mean on a lot of guns you'll see the lock is actually attached into the action or goes into the action. This being a back action island lock means that island sits completely surrounded by wood. I think that's absolutely stunning. I really like the engraving around the top lever as well. In fact, the engraving across the bits that aren't um, rotten and striated are quite nice. And herein lies the problem. If you actually look at the action, it's got pitting and striation across its course. The barrels are 27 inch Damascus. And you know, it's a birdie. The Damascus is of high quality, but, and here's the but, they are thin, pitted and dented, and black powder proof only. That is um, not so good, that is not so good. Other than the island locks and the fact it's a very beautiful looking gun, it's a 14 and a quarter inch stock and 27 inch barrels, it's a small beautiful looking gun, small things can still be beautiful. The grip safety I find absolutely awesome. It's a very small period in history where this was even considered a good option. In hammer guns, safety catches on top are fairly rare. You do see some. They had a pair of purdies in the mainsail with a safety catch that you pulled back, which was um, to, to make it go, which was quite interesting. If you pull the hammer back and pull the trigger, nothing will happen. You need to push this safety catch upwards, the grip safety. When you're gripping it, the safety comes off. Take that, pull the trigger, obviously let the hammer down slowly, and away you go. The, the barrels aren't that bad. They're not, just not that good. You could probably buy this gun and save it, or at least buy this gun and get it into a shootable condition. But, hey, a thousand pound purdy, there you go. I really could spend weeks in here documenting my way through oddities, weird guns, making a bit of a catalog of weird and wonderful. And this would be at the top of my list if I were to do just that. This is a Valmet 412, which usually wouldn't draw my interest. They're a good quality gun, mostly because you can drop rifle barrels in. The, the versatility of these, the interchangeability of the barrels is wild. In fact, this one comes with three barrels, a 26 inch skeet set, a 30 inch ejector sporter set, and this 36 inch set of barrels. It's got a Monte Carlo stock, the sliding shroud at the top that keeps it locked, a plain action that just says Valmet 412 on. But yeah, these tubes, Oh, they're pretty cool, 36 inches. I mean, I am a fan of 36 inch barrels, it turns out. I mean, I've not shot this, but it's proportional. It's proportionate. The stock's a bit short, the stock's 14 and a quarter inch, but those 36 inches do. I mean, they feel quite lively to be fair. There's no top rib, which is bizarre. I do wonder what they were for, other than compensating. They are monstrous. This gun, unfortunately, is a little bit too much for me to just buy as a curiosity. It's six, five, five, six hundred pounds, four to six hundred pounds, which for a triple barreled set is actually really good value, especially those 36 inch barrels, which are extremely rare. I might put a cheeky bit on it just to see. Next to it is one I don't want to share, but I will. I've always found it funny. This is a feg of Budapest. That's in Hungary. I used to live with some Hungarian guys, and Hungary to me is like a country that produces very high-end artisanal 
craftsman stuff. And yet this could be the ugliest gun in the sale. I remember shooting one a long time ago. Yeah, those triggers are absolutely chronic. I mean, that's, that's a 30 pound gun. In normal world, there's some really nice things here. You've got a load of Berettas, some ultralights, some 686s, some 682s, some Browning Synergies, Satori's. It's not a bad place to just come and buy a very average gun, but it's still a great gun. I say an average gun, a more normal gun than a 36 inch Balmain. A normal stock looks like this, very straight in line with the gun. It's ever so slightly offset left or right so that when you mount it, your eye looks down the rib. This gun has been for a few beers. This is what we call a crossover stock. Essentially, a right-handed shooter who had lost or damaged their right eye and needed to look out of their left eye. I mean, there, there are other options out there as well, but the craftsmanship it takes to make a gun like this is pretty insane. Not only is the stock hard to make and you need to find the perfect piece of wood, but if you look carefully, the locks, the hammers, the top strap, this piece here, the safety catch, the trigger guard, are all bent and folded in line with the gun. I don't think there are many people alive today, if anybody who has the skill to make one of these. So it's not just about bending it, but getting it regulated so that it works reliably is pretty mental. And when I say no one alive today, because this gun was built in 1885 when crossover stocks were much more common than they are now. The barrels were nitro-poofed or nitro-reproofed in 1958. What an amazing gun. The depressing part, or maybe the interesting part, for, you know, the action is, is worn, the engraving is worn, it's beautiful rose and scroll, or bouquet and light scroll. It's 150 to 200 pounds. That is a beautiful gun for that money, and for any collection or curiosity, that sits right up there. I love the hammers being octagonal at the front, and I love this lever release fore end. How cute is that? It's such a simple thing. I just, I think I might prefer it to the standard lever. Maybe not. There's no preference. I like it as well. Final touch is a heel and toe plates on the back. And um, that side lever action is, is nice. That could be a lot of fun if you get it back into working condition. That would be worthy of a light restoration just to shoot a crossover hammer gun. And hey, even if you never shot it, you own a Blanche, and that's no bad thing. Simon, it's sealed bid time. Uh, this is probably more our cup of tea as a buyer than an enthusiast. Is that fair to say? Yes, I mean, there's so much to choose from in the sealed bid. Um, I haven't had a proper look around yet because we've just finished the main sale yesterday. Now we focus our attention on condition reports for the sealed bids and it's my chance now to have a wander about and find out if there's anything that leaps out. It could yeah. get expensive. It can be, it can be and there are some, there's there's often things wrong that you will have to factor in to fix. It's not always the way but it, it is one of those things that it's, they're cheap, they're cheap for a reason. Um, they're priced to sell a lot of this stuff so, but there are some bargains. I always look at it as the opportunity to own things I couldn't afford the best version of. Well there is that, yeah. And there's something nice about doing things up as yeah. well. As, uh, you know, passion projects. We all like a passion project. Yeah, I mean, if you're anything like me, I have a lot of passion projects that I haven't like moved past the buy it stage. Yeah, that's true. Um, and we have a lot of clients who we also sell gun cabinets to. What have you gone for? Well, I've gone for, it's not terribly exciting, but it is, typical of what we were discussing earlier where there's some good bargains to be had with a little bit a few issues effectively but most of them are cosmetic this is a beretta 390 silver mallard 20 bore multi-choke it's the sort of thing that you know my kids are going to be progressing to soft recoil good starter gun nice to shoot very shootable very shootable multi-choke as well doesn't come with the spare chokes but these chokes are available where i mean they're 10 a penny they're exactly brand they're around 40 quid second hand you can buy a set for 40 quid exactly the only real issues with this are a couple of very light marks on the receiver and the finish, the matte varnish, has gone slightly milky on the stock. And if yeah. you strip it, you could do that yourself. What's that, 250, 350, something like that? Something like that. 6538 is the lot number. Good gun. The other end of the spectrum, <laughs> this is a Ithaca Model 37. It's a 16 gauge variant with a thing. I don't like the thing. I feel like that ruins it. Yeah. Without it, Compensators. it would be a good looking gun. I have a few American correspondents who all rate this as the best bomb action ever made. And I've never shot one, not in a time when I didn't just shoot it and not pay much attention to it because it was just a stinky old American gun. Yeah. Now, 
That's more of a kind of sure. <laughs> Pump actions are fun, there is no doubt. They are fun to shoot. A rack in the slide for your next shot, it sometimes takes you time to get your head around it if you're used to, to run over and under. Um, and they, these Ethicas were a little bit more robust than most, weren't they? It is nicely made. Yeah. Like, a couple of scratches down there. Is that a crack or is that a scratch? That's no, just a scratch. OK, cool. It's, what, 80 years old? That's, yeah, it's it can have a scratch. Oh, it's okay. got, it's yeah. got some age behind it, hasn't it? So we'll forgive it a few blemishes and a few knocks. I understand that as a pump, most people will be looking for something more abusable, but this will take the abuse and it's got his history. Yeah. It's on my list. It's 16 and that inherently makes it a bit more leaky, but that's okay. Yeah, but I mean, everyone complains the cartridges for 16 bore are expensive. They're not, relatively. They're around, they're not any more than the 20 bore cartridge. You know, the top of the range game load is gonna be much more expensive than your average 16 load. So it's always that myth of, oh, they're too expensive to shoot. They're not really, you're not gonna be pumping 10,000 rounds for it a year. No, are they're, you? they're, they're not play fun. guns, No, that's for sure. Well, they are for you. <laughs> That'll shoot anyway. So I've dragged these aside because I think that this pair of guns might be the buy of the sale. You know, they're a bit odd, but they are 1,200 to 1,500 pounds, lot 6412. That's 1,200 to 1,500 pounds for two guns. And when I tell you these guns are in 20 bore with 28 bore sets of barrels to go with each, I found that quite exciting. I am showing them to you so that hopefully I can't afford them. I think these are wonderful guns. They are very simply Italian over and under. Sorry. They are a match pair and the matching is actually pretty good by the look of it. I think the number one gun is prettier or certainly prettier in the woods. So that is the one that we're going to look over. They have 13 and a quarter inch stocks. There you go. There's the big downside. That's why they're probably in here and not in the main sale. The stocks are oil finished, very beautiful pieces of walnut, lovely sleek lines with grip caps, full extended trigger tangs, single selective triggers, and you know, I don't even hate the uh, selector that much. I do, I mean, a non-selector would be far, far, far more gentlemanly. The guns are marked one and two, or one, one and one on the fore end, so you don't mix up the parts. That's quite an important thing with pairs where they look identical, but probably aren't regulated identically that you get the right barrels on the right guns and that's fine. I often get asked why you can't interchange them, and certainly in certain brands you can, but in more hand-finished guns, that just is not an option. The action, barrels, stock, and all the work, it's laser checkered, by the way, is done by Fratelli Poly, who we saw at Catcher Village, which is very exciting, because we don't see many of them in the UK. And in fact, this one wasn't even destined for the UK, because on the bottom, it is branded as Kevin's Plantation Collection. It's got a quail on the bottom, was very nicely laser done. We're not going to argue that out. And it was imported to the USA by British Sporting Arms, Millbrook, New York. On the bottom, you have FPA marks for Fratelli Poly Army and 28 bore 70 mil. So these are 70 mil, 28 gauge barrels. This gun was made in 2013, so it's only a decade old, which I was chatting to someone younger than me the other day and they referred to a 10 year old gun as old. And I realized I was selling guns 10 years ago. And that's pretty sad for me. I like the skinny ribs. It is ventilated on the top, solid on the mid. And the action is built by Poly, but honestly, the design just looks like Rizzini based style gun coming out of Valtrompia. I like it. I think it represents great money or great value for money. My only gripe is that stock length, um, but I'm a big man. You could have it extended. It does have a 5 8 inch pad, which is a, a bit of a bugger. It would be a big wedge you'd put on the back. But if you think if you put a nice wooden extension on there, you wouldn't be in for a massive amount of money for a very pretty usable pair of small ball guns. Not that you particularly need a pair of small ball guns, but why not? You know, we could rip them apart. There's a, a slight wood to metal fit issue. It's not too perfect. But this is a hand built or very much hand finished pair of very reasonably priced guns in 20 and 28 ball. I'm spitting with those. So this next choice that's poked out at me is 7152. It's an SW Silver & Co under lever hammer gun from 1885. Bold Damascus barrels, lovely looking thing. Really nice, it's a little very... bit of colour left on the action. Brown's lovely as well. Brown's nice, colour under the hammers, bit of dirt here and there. It does have one significant issue, however, which it's a side is... side-by-side. It's the crack through the hand, there. <sighs> Repair? It's re it's not repair. It's not wobbling. You can't feel that wobble. Um, but it's being pinned almost by the extended top tang, the island lock plate, and the trigger guard tang as well. It's all holding that together. Now that wood pin. There are people out there who can do amazing things with woodwork. Pin and glue that, and you've got a really nice gun. Four to six hundred pounds because it's a good-looking hammer gun. Classic lines. Classic elegant. 
SW Silver, interesting maker, more famous for the orange recoil pad, the silver's recoil pad. Same really? Company. That's very interesting. Yeah. Imagine your legacy as a gun maker being the pads he used. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. Um, so that's what's followed him yeah. down the history and down the years. But really nice flat top, fine cut checkering. Nice looking thing. The rib is stunning. Yeah. Wide, uncheckered, but just beautiful. Just lovely. The thing flows properly. That's a properly built, properly made gun, my kind of thing. I have gone a bit more weird and wonderful. You have. Uh, this is, I mean, I want to point out something, right? So it's made in school, and it's made by a company called Gecardo, but you have to turn it upside down to be able to read the name. <laughs> this is a proper right-hand shooter's gun. It's a over and under 29 and a half inch, 1920 built gun. And it's solid, look at it. <sighs> and more over, it's just, that action carving does weird stuff to me. That is I can see why. There's a lot of work that's gone into shaping that heading up stock, making it fit. Yeah. The shape as it flows through and moves around and the top bolster yeah. of the action moving into the barrel, that's and a nice touch. Usually those bolsters I don't like too much. It's a bit proud, but where you've got that double stepped action, it's It complements it, doesn't it? Yeah, and the engraving is nice. The bordering works. It's a well-designed gun, cocky indicators. There's touches of class on this. So there's a little tip to the top tang there yeah. that flows down, mirrored at the point where there is no drop point. It's quite tasty. And that is yeah. a nice, elegant mirror. There's symmetry all over it. The top lever, as it joins the action under here, you've got beautiful symmetry of line mm. there. It's just a lovely thing. It hides its depth well, and that forend is really beautifully proportioned. It it's a stunning gun, three to 500 quid, mm. nitro-proof. Three love that. 70 mil chamber. It's a bit of a geeky gun, yeah. but you could enjoy it. You could. It's a totally usable modern gun. The stock specs aren't terrible. It's totally shootable. I find most Merkles come in like rest on your chin stock. This, you could actually, I could shoot it. Yeah. And that's good enough for me. And there are a lot of people who can't get their head around double triggers if, you, if you've grown up and always used a single trigger. Yeah. But actually, and I was explaining this to a client the other day, the fastest barrel selector ever made, yeah. double trigger. I, You're not I, passing around with a little yeah. tab trying to push it over or a safety catch moving to the left or to the right. You just go bang, move back, bang. Are we going to discuss the glaring issue with it? Do you want to mention the problem? Not that big a problem, is it? It's there, and we probably ought to point out that <laughs> it's got a massive crack and warpage on the forehead. Yeah. If you hadn't had that pointed out in a condition report, you'd be pretty upset. We would be mentioning that kind of problem. Your crack stock yeah. is more of an issue than a crack forehead. True. Structurally, a stock is more important, True. obviously, than a forehand but they're both repairable. Yep. And I mean, that is just a work of art. For three to 500 pounds, that's a cracking gun. Sometimes you walk into the sealed bedroom and something jumps off the shelf that you shouldn't like. Like this. This is being affectionately referred to as the guilt ridden. It is underneath an Army Jaeger M1622 copy, but it's had a hell of a paint job. Look, I don't know whether this is done in good taste or not, but it is a, it's just an interesting thing, and I had to share it with you because it's a curiosity. It's got a custom camouflage stock with the honeycomb back on it. I mean, that that's a lot of work's gone into this. You have all these custom stickers all the way around the outside. I'm not in stickers, they're cutouts, which is interesting. All of the metal is gun metal war and finish. They've taken the black off and then polished it in certain areas. It certainly looks aged. It's, it looks like some kind of apocalypse paint job. You have Heathen written on the side of the, the mag there. The mag is actually a dummy. Look in the bottom, there's, there's, there's the hole for a 2-2 mag, which is, uh, you know, interesting. You have Away With You written on the side. A lot of effort has gone into this gun for a 2-2. I admire that, if nothing else. The forehead has the same custom paint job with a crosshatch finish around the, the finger groove there. And on the bottom, you have guilt ridden written. I don't hate how much effort has been put into this, and I feel guilt ridden for liking it. It's probably time to admit I have a problem. I walk into that room and any step-up rib trap gun from 1985 to 1995, I seem to be drawn to. I don't really know why. I think it's because they are kind of ugly and obtuse and old, but still very capable. They are interesting. This is actually a gun that I once shot very regularly. This is a Winchester 8500 trap. I'm a fan of these. 
and this one is no exception, although this one does feel slightly different to the one I used to shoot. It's certainly heavy. This gun is £9.15. Well, and everything on this gun is big. It's lot 6142. And it is 125 to 185 pounds, which is an odd you know, valuation, but there is a reason why as well. It's a, it's a little loose, but we'll get to that in a minute. The fore end weighs as much as most 410s, and these 32 inch barrels, which will be choked ridiculously full and ridiculously full, will pummel stuff. I can attest to that very well. I like the stippling on the back. I've always liked the sight picture of a step up rib. There is something about the that way that soaks up the light and leads you into the front end of that very long non-tapered rib some ribs have this really like cross hatching these guys went for like went for it you could use this as a file and get away with it it is proper single bead sight at the front and vented mid rib as well the action is plain on them it's plain black but it's got this silver borderline and then some engraving around the the trends of the front. I think it's a really classy looking gun, really classy. I've also liked that te matte textured finish runs all the way around the back of the action and onto the top lever. It's just, it's a nice to have that contrast. You see it on certain modern guns now where they use laser stippling to give you a matte finish and then they mix it with hand polishing. It's a nice thing. It, it works. It gives you all the feeling of, of niceness without just having a rough action all over. The stocks were very nice pieces of walnut. I think they're very nice pieces of walnut. This one has been weighted. No walnut in the world is that heavy. Like, <laughs> this is ridiculously heavy. I'd love to take it apart and see quite how much weight was added. It's a great gun, and at that money, it would be the gun I'd buy out of this sale to add to my ever-growing collection of useless old trap guns that aren't useless. It is loose on the face, and by loose on the face, I mean every gun is jointed from a hinge to a flat face, and that flat face needs to be flat and tight against the back of the action so no gas escapes. This is for safety, longevity, and also recoil. If that, ga that gap is loose, this gun will kick. Winchesters are sloppy anyway, so everyone will pick up a Winchester and just open it and close it, and it will feel like an absolute bag of spanners. But, but honestly, coming from shooting Winchesters when I was younger and Brownings and Marukus, I kind of used to a gun that just flops open and closed. I quite like it. The problem is when that's closed is it should be tight, tight as you like. And you can hear that. It's not that way. And it's not that way. That is not good. You can actively see light between the barrels and the action. This gun needs a rejoint and that is why it is cheap. A rejoint wouldn't be too expensive. Four to five hundred pounds on one of these would have a very good job done. There are temporary fixes you could do. I would rather you didn't do that to this beautiful old piece of history. Last thing, and this is very cool, the trigger is half checkered on the right hand side. Again, little classy things that Winchester did to their top end gun. Those 1980s Winchesters were special. I picked two. That's cheating. Yeah, but mine suck. But they're, <laughs> they're, they're vaguely interesting. So you're doubling up. Yeah, and you've probably picked something much nicer. Do you want to start, Jimmy? Uh, I'll do you one. Um, so I'm going to start with this one first. This is actually not interesting to anybody but me. But actually, no, the other one is less interesting. This is a Breeder Vega Lusso. Keen-eyed viewers will see that it looks an awful lot like a Beretta 686, and that's because it is a Beretta-made gun, Breeder-stamped. However, unlike other people who've done that in the past, who've kept the styling exactly the same, their raised half side plate, as they call it, is a completely different shape. And then they've completely failed to bleed that line into the stock, which that upsets would have been me. Nice. But I do think that's quite yeah. pretty. That's a nice touch. It's a little bit more rude than the yeah. standard it's a, it's version. It's half a nice touch, isn't it? It just needs to go on. Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> they like, well, we've got enough budget to machine the actions differently. Yeah. But it is interesting. Uh, not many people, well, Brett may against quite a few people, but yeah. not anymore. This is one of them. It's one of them, yeah. And it's 6250 and it's a couple of hundred quid for a 686. You can't really argue with that, can you? Because you know what no. you're getting. Uh, I did notice the multi checks missing, but it's again, it's, it's, a, it's one of those mobiles, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, you can so. go to your local gun truck, they'll have a bin of them. Unless Breeder decide to use their own choke, which in which case you won't. <laughs> <laughs> go on then, what you So, got? I have gone for an Englishman that isn't English. Continental in origin, retailed by W. Richards of Liverpool. This is an English over and under made either in Belgium or in France. Josh and I are thinking in French. It's not pretty in a way a boss over and under is pretty. It's a little bit bulky there, but there's touches of quality and touches of class. Mm -hmm. I've, seen, I've seen similar mm -hmm. um, 
retailed by well-known English makers. W. Richards of Liverpool was a highly respected maker. Oh yeah, 250 to 350 pounds, I think it is. It's lot 6230. It, at the moment, I walked straight past it, came back to it, walked past it again, came back to it again, Just looked it up and went, ah, oh, that's more interesting than I thought. And that is typical of the seal bit, yeah. is you go, oh, that's not quite what I first thought. Yeah. I feel embarrassed to show you my second gun now. Oh, go on then, get it out. This <laughs> is 30 to 50 pounds. Well, it would want to be. At a distance, it looks like every other cheap, nasty Spanish over and under. But this one is different. Okay, how different is it? Uh, this is lot 6278. It is a D-arm, die arm, which is interesting. So, short history lesson, the Spanish gun trade was not doing very well. So they all banded together, other than three makers, and said, we're going to create a gun making conglomerate with our combined might. It didn't go very well. There are reports that they made no guns, up to the reports making a few thousand guns. The government gave them a lot of money, and they had a lot of money and equipment to start with. It's a bit of a black hole. We went out to Spain and no one wanted to talk about it, which is what oh. intrigues me. There's very little on the internet other than the same regurgitated shite from books. Oh. And this gun has Dion written on the side. Dion was the name of that very company. Okay. This proves they at least made one gun. You know, we're talking Spanish gun making in the late 80s. They were still on the price war. It's not nice in the slightest, but it's not absolute poo either. No, it was budget then, it's still budget now. Yes, but budget has... maybe budget's not got any better. For £50, I will be bidding on this. Okay. Um, mostly so I can use it as like an inspiration to actually finish this bloody film on Spanish gun making. <laughs> but it is an interesting thing. Okay. Uh, very niche. Yeah. Very, yeah. I don't think there's room for many other people in your niche. But, you know. I mean, I'm sorry. <laughs> I resent bringing it out now. <laughs> it's worth saying that there are some of the best well, at least guns in the world here. At least it's between us and you didn't do it in public. So Holtz isn't just about shotguns. Over the years we've looked through their air rifles, we've looked through their rifles, and this time I have a particular fascination with a couple of guns that I am actually going to be hunting for for personal use, as well as a few video ideas I have, and here are two examples of things I'm actually after. This is an Enfield 303. I was actually trying to find myself a 577 450, but there is something about the acquisition of ammo, or having to load it, and the black powder thing, having to clean it a little bit more thoroughly that potentially put me off that, but they've got half a dozen 303s here, some of which I quite like. This is lot 4970, and actually comes with a Metford bayonet, which is, yeah, it's pretty cool, isn't it? So you can take that off and, and run around. But it's an artillery carbine. You know, these things were in service all the way until 1918 around our empire at the time, and certainly for training and marksmanship projects. It's, it's a pretty cool thing. This one was actually nitro-proofed recently, and it's 350 pounds. I think it's a bargain for an old gun. The problem I find with buying anything like this is a shotgun, providing you measure the barrels, it's gonna shoot. And if not, it doesn't shoot, it's gonna go click and you can make it go bang. The problem with something like this as well, and this is, this is 250 to 350 pounds. It's a pretty rough one. I don't know why I picked this. This is a short Lee Mark III. Is whether they shoot or not? And that for me is a, a big question because I don't really know the answer. I know you can look and I know how to test them and I've looked down plenty, but I know what one that will shoot looks like and I know what one that won't shoot looks like. But a one that will shoot is quite a big bracket and the one that won't shoot is quite a big bracket. You know, it's not on or off. There's a lot of gray area between pinpoint accuracy and you know, not being able to hit that at 50 yards. I guess the only way is to use your common sense, look at it, best judgment, and chuck a bid in. These guys will do you condition reports on them, but again, they're not gonna go out and shoot it and give you a group. This is why Lee Enfields are certainly cheaper at Holtz than in certain shops, because with a shop, there's gotta be an accuracy guarantee. Or at least, hopefully, you'd hope. I was just browsing the Enfields, trying to find one that looks the best, but isn't six or 700 pounds, because obviously the better condition ones are worth more money. And I found two guns that I quite like, but I also then turned around and stumbled into this, lot 2090. I'd seen this on the website. It is a Manu France, a Brevet Ideal in 24 gauge. 24 gauge still exists on the continent as something that is pretty common. Trying to find fiber or 24 gauge is a little harder, but the plastic wads are, are all there. It goes hand in hand with 32 gauge as a weird curiosity. I know that's quite big in America as well as the continent. Interesting in England? Interestingly in England, absolutely. 
absolutely nobody wants it because the ammunition is almost non-existent here and what we do get is imported so much so that this gun is an off ticket gun this is a non-licensable gun because it's an obsolete caliber 24 but you could buy it put it on your license and go out and have some weird geeky fun i mean if you thought the 16 ball was a bit edgy this is the most edgy this was a mullet before mullets became fashionable again and I've seen 24 balls shot by a, a very nice Belgian gentleman and he absolutely nailed birds. Obviously, 24 ball gauge sits between 20 and 28. So you're looking at 23, 25 grams, three quarters of an ounce max, that kind of thing, just over three quarters of an ounce. You can't really be picky with the ammunition choice because, well, it's one of those you get what you take things. Little lever breaker, Honestly, you could own this as a pretty thing to just stick on your wall in a secure fashion, obviously, or semi-secure fashion. It's not like a non-obsolete caliber gun, but fascinating. Haven't seen one at Holtz before. Seen a couple in real life. The 32 is the one I'd really like, but a 24, and this is 300 pounds, it will be a nice thing to own. I am so disappointed in this gun. I um, saw it in the pictures and I thought that could be very interesting. This is a Renato Gamba Oxford 90, a um, side by side. Renato Gamba made some very fine over and unders and I believe their name was perhaps on some Spanish side by sides at one point. And this one I was kind of excited to come and see. Uh, a new model, you never know. Every time you come and see something new, it's a roll of the dice. 6678, I say disappointment. It's six, four to 600 pounds. It's not a ridiculous amount of money. It's worth mentioning that it's also a 20 gauge, so it's actually probably better value given that 20s in small gauge side by sides are always at a whopping premium. It's got 27 and three quarter inch barrels. It's got a 14 and three quarter inch stock of which the line is very nice. It's not a badly made thing. Just the engraving is pretty depressing. In fact, the quality of it is perhaps not where one would expect. I do think that SAB Renato Gamba, they have been known for making various qualities of guns up to top quality. I've seen with their London guns, it's called London. That was quite nice. This one is, there's nothing inherently wrong with it, but it just feels cheaper than I expected it to. You know, the barrels are actually really quite nice. There's nothing wrong with the way this gun is built. I think it's just finished, finished to a different taste. And then you've got the way that Renato Gamba Gardone VT Brescia Italy if it's put on top. It's just there's certain markers about it that it just feels a bit budget and it probably is so I really shouldn't argue it. I think I was just disappointed. I was expecting something great. The gun has done very little. It locks up nice and tight. There's no shake. It's clean. It's very very clean. It's actually a good purchase at the money but when you big something up in your head it's, uh, it's always disappointing when it lets you down isn't it and that's a bit miserable but I'm not let down to good gun. I suppose I'm always just looking for a bargain, but not the end of the world. It is a single trigger 20 bore side by side with a decent length stock and relatively decent barrels with a flat hand filed rib. These are things I can get behind. 100% I could shoot it and shoot it to a decent standard, which I can't say for most 20 gauge side by sides, given that most are old and finished 100 years ago for small people. That is good value. You just might want to paint it black. There's a couple more guns in here I do want to share with you. Things that I would actually put my money into if I didn't already have one or two even of them. And the first has blended delightfully into the background. This is a Gamba Gold SP. Many of you will remember I bought one of these, but the gold plated version. I tell you what, that is a fantastic gun. I absolutely love that gun. The slight step, the handwork that goes into it, obviously because I'm an idiot the detachable trigger. I um, I can't help but think they represent great value for money. I think this is 300 to 400 pounds, lot 6387. They are a fantastic gun. They were a fantastic gun, certainly. I can't see a, a reason why you wouldn't buy one of these Fratelli Gambas. The slight palm swell, it's such a shootable gun. Yeah, I must admit that gold SP I should shoot that more, it's an amazing gun. As well as looking for high-end London guns for no money, it's always worth looking for decent commercial investments, a gun you could use and then sell, or a gun you could buy and refurb and sell, or even a gun that you've always wanted that perhaps you 
didn't have the budget for. Here is a case and point of something like that. And it is all about making concessions, right, about things, and there's a definite concession with this. Lot 6408 is a 23-year-old Beretta double E double L. We can all agree that the 680 platform that it's based on is fantastic. It is a 20 gauge. I've been looking at a lot of sub gauges this auction. I should call them small bores. Hey, look, the viewership split between England and America. I'm sorry, but we can all share the languages. I'm sure in that four ball video, I actually might have said, maybe I didn't, that neither is correct. It should be called a 20 gauge bore. And that is what they used to call it. And then as more modern parlances came along, America just kept the gauge and we just kept the bore. And I finally found a reason and an actual explanation of why we call them different things. And the fact that we're both wrong makes me feel good. Anyway, Beretta 687 double double L Diamond Pigeon, one of the most successful common sold side bladed guns in the world ever. This one is seven to 900 pounds. It's got the standard stock, so you can interchange the pads. It's 14 and a quarter currently. You can take that out to about 15 and a quarter with their pads without spacers. You have a 28 inch fixed choke barrel. That is choked quarter and improved cylinder in one of these. The side plates are beautiful and it's from a period of where their engraving was quite nice. And again, it's all personal preference, but they have changed over the years. The wood on it is fantastic, I think. It's very nice. I mean, the gun really has seen no use. You look at it and it's done almost nothing. And yet, somewhere along the course of its life, somebody decided to checker the stock. It is a straight hand stock, and the checkering is about the worst job I've ever seen. And that is a really complimentary word for it. I always many words you could use that would be worse. It's bad. It's really very, very bad. However, it's not so bad that the gun isn't worth seven to nine hundred pounds. If you're savvy with your money and you do search and you take the time and you understand that this is okay to shoot for now, you could quite happily wait for a spare stock to come up on eBay, a spare stock to come up in Holtz, a spare stock to come up in your local gun shop, and you'll be paying three or four hundred pounds, maybe. You could get a double double L 20 ball fixed choke for fifteen hundred pounds. It's interesting and important at this point, I point out that guns like this. The estimate is seven to nine hundred, but it's a sealed bid sale. And for those of you who don't know how that works, you have to put a bid in before the auction starts. There is no auction day. There's no auctioneer. You put the bid in you're willing to pay. If you're the highest, you win. You pay commission on it. If someone else bids the same before you, they win. If someone bids the same after you, you win. It's quite a simple thing. It, it, it can be frustrating, but only when you don't take something seriously enough. You'll soon know that you actually should have bid more when you lose something and you go, I wish I'd bid more. And you'll soon know that no one else wanted it if you bid below the asking price or in that middle bracket and no one else bids. It's a really tough thing. Serious bids win, I say this every time. Serious bids win, casual bids don't. But yeah, what a lovely gun. I would love to meet who did that check rig. That is clearly ambition outweighing talent. But hey, this gun's still shootable. And you don't look, at, look, you cover it up when you shoot it, your friends will never know. At Holt Seal Bid, there are a lot of boxes. We used to play box roulette, we don't do that anymore because I always pull out the wrong stuff. <laughs> so I set Simon on a task to go through the boxes or at least find one in a case that you think is nice. Yeah, it's a usable, not very modern. It's 1904, uh, but it's by one of my favorite makers, which is William Rochester Pape. Pape was a prolific inventor, based up in Newcastle upon Tyne, supplier of fishing rods, fishing tackle, gun maker, and he made some really interesting, really quirky guns. Had his own style. In, okay. Some of his hammer guns were very, very stylish. I mean, he's a long way from London. He is, yeah. And he's he's catering to, uh, I think he built guns for the, the Dukes of Northumberland as well, because they were around there. Wow. Um, but all of the landed gentry up there, all of the, the businessmen who were out shooting, he, he built really good quality guns, and he has a following paint. This one I picked out because it's a very usable side by side. Nice pistol grip, which is what you know, mm. modern shooters like. It's got a three inch chamber and side clips. It's a not overly heavy English box lock, non ejector, uh, probably a wire fouling style gun, not a live pigeon gun because it's not quite high enough quality for live pigeon shooting. Um, but it's my kind of box lock and you could crush clays quite happily with this. It's true cylinder right, half choke on the left. What more do you want? I'll do what you want. Two to three hundred quid with a case. Unarguable bargain. 
I mean, that is my kind of thing. 300 pounds. Plus commission, obviously. No. We've got to mention that. We always yeah. do. But it's just a... a it's 30% on 300 pound. Like, yeah. if we were talking about a 10 grand going 30% is a huge dent in your pocket. Yes. But 300 plus commissions, 400, best part of. Yeah. 400 pounds. Nice wide rib, not file cut, plain rib mm -hmm. with the maker's name written on it. You can save yourself quite a bit of money by shopping for non-ejectors. I mean, look at the way that finial is inlet. That's gorgeous. It's a very high quality gun. That's beautiful. I mean, that is a lot of work to get that. Is it that good? Is it bad that it makes me sad that's only 300 pounds? It is a little bit of a travesty, in my opinion. Um, but there we are. Uh, look, you can look at it two ways. Either we are criminally undervaluing this, or that's a complete bargain. It's definitely a bargain. I'll go with bargain. We were just packing up to leave, saying goodbye to the guys, and I got shown this. This is going in the next main sale, and I thought I'd share it with you. The teak boxes that come with it give away the game. that say Purdy Sport, a 20 gauge lead, and steel. It comes in a beautiful leather case, and it's always a treat to sort of get the advanced viewing on these. This is coming into the next auction at 15 to 20 grand, which is a lot of money by comparison to some of the guns we've seen today. But when you open it up, it is really very beautiful. It is a Purdy sport a 30 inch 20 bore sporter it's really very nice we did a video on the new version this is one of the ones that was oh, it's half italian half english I, I remember people at the time saying it's uh it's not truly london i tell you what i have no issues with this gun whatsoever it is a beautiful modern looking gun and if it's half italian i mean they, they are makers of some of the best over and unders in the world so it's not it's not really an insult, is it? Obviously, I like it because you can pull the trig unit out. The gun's proof marks say it was London proofed in 2011. I love the engraving, I love the scroll back. I think that engraving pattern is really beautiful, but this little bordering on the trigger unit or, or to the where the detachable trigger comes out and this little crossed etching with the straight line shading, this is a lovely gun. Guys, thank you very much for watching. I look forward to being back here in November and checking out what they've got other than this little sweet purdy. We'll see you soon. Good luck in the sealed bid. I've put my bids in. I uh, look forward to hearing what you guys have bought as always. Thank you for watching guys. This channel is made possible by our amazing sponsors. You can find out more about them in the description down below. And if you want to support the channel, you can join as a member. You get loads of extra content. Well, some extra content. And occasionally we hook up and go clay shooting together as a membership group. If you don't feel like joining today, we really appreciate you watching and subscribing. Have a wonderful day.